right, then uh, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time today. I'm speaking with someone that I wanted to have on for a really long time, Mike Matthews, who is without any question is running one of the biggest fitness empires on the internet. Uh, just to illustrate how big it is, I'm in the Balkan area myself. And just the other day, someone shot me over an article asking uh, what I think about this push-pull legs routine. And it was Mike Mike's article, actually. So it's pretty huge. So Mike, thank you so much for taking the time today. <laughs> thank you. Uh, although I will say um, in, the, in the supplement space, for example, there are quite a few bigger players. But um, I would say maybe, maybe while what I'm doing is not the biggest, if you just if you just measure it by revenue, um, it is multifaceted, which you don't find very often. And that I sell a lot of books, and I do have popular blogs and a podcast and supplements and an app and stuff like that. Yeah. So I have a a, a a unique ecosystem, I think. Yeah. Uh, do you do you find it ironic that you built a massive legacy for yourself in the fitness world and? Anytime you're, someone is getting you on a podcast, they are asking you about business-related things? Um, uh, I, I, well, I mean, I don't know. I do, it kind of goes 50-50. So sometimes it's business stuff um, and sometimes it's just strictly fitness stuff. I think the some people find the business stuff more interesting than the fitness, which I understand because um, – they're my as far as my information goes and really what my quote unquote expertise is if we're talking about fitness it's really geared toward just everyday normal people who want to get into good shape and that's by design i i, I wanted to cater to that crowd as opposed to uh maybe someone like um, eric helms or maybe greg knuckles who both produce fantastic content very smart guys know a lot more than i do about the uh the weightlifting game for sure um but their information caters more to the intermediate or advanced crowd um even the way that they communicate and the way that they write caters a bit more to the more knowledgeable people and so i think the you know the fundamentals that the average person needs to understand there's really not that much and it is pretty easy to put together and so there are only so many, so many things that are even worth discussing. So I think sometimes when I come on podcasts, instead of talking about flexible dieting or, you know, the importance of mechanical tension or progressive overload or compound weightlifting, things that for many people who listen to fitness podcasts, they go, yeah, yeah of course, everybody knows that. Tell, yeah. tell me something new. Tell me something interesting. And then the business stuff, though, is can be the new and interesting, you know? Absolutely. So, um, if you, I mean, speaking, uh, we were just talking about your success uh, just a few minutes ago. Uh, if you like, if we look at the factors that can make somebody successful, such as intelligence, hard work, and luck, what would you say are like, how do you think these factors for yourself play into this, like in terms of proportion, like which factors do you think uh, give the most amount of this puzzle for yourself when you look at your history? Um, well, if I'm speaking for, for myself, I would say there it was definitely a, a factor of timing. Um, I published Bigger, Leaner, Stronger back in 2012. That was the right book at the right time. And it was written the right way and it was marketed the right way. But there are always those opportunities. There are probably an infinite number of those opportunities uh, in if, if you're looking across all the different ways that you can you can sell things and all the different industries that you can be in and all the different genres you can write in. Um, it's just being able to spot them and being able to understand what, uh, it's really understand a, a problem that many people have that you can solve in a unique and effective way. Um, and so there definitely was a, that I'd say that was probably the luck was the timing that and that wasn't by by plan it wasn't engineered it really was just one of those things where i was like why hasn't someone just written a book like bigger leaner stronger like why does that not exist i, I just want a book i want the book that i wish somebody would have just given me when i was 17 getting into weightlifting and it would have saved me a lot of time and effort and frustration but that's really the story of I would say all most breakthrough type of products. Uh, Bigger than stronger has sold about five hundred thousand copies since twenty twelve, oh, wow. um, which is pretty good in the, in the realm of publishing on the whole. That's not that impressive to me, at least. Um, you know, Michelle Obama sold a million books in her first week. <laughs> so, uh, but but it, as far as a fitness book goes, it's very good. It's it's definitely the the best selling self-published fitness book of all time, not best-selling fitness book of all time. That's probably, 
as far as I know, uh, probably Body for Life that sold about three million copies. Um, and, when we, and then when you get into just general health and diet, you get into probably ten plus million copies with with different titles. Um, so my book has has done relatively that that book has done relatively well, and the I would say the really there's probably that's probably about it for as far as as far as the luck factor goes and then um and then as far as hard work goes yeah i mean i have probably averaged i don't know for the first few years probably averaged 70 hours a week of work like actual work and maybe if we want to take out let's say 65 whatever uh of real work not distracted work not where you're quote unquote working on something, but you have social media open, you're flipping back and forth or email open and you're flipping back and forth or blah, 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 real work. And, um, these days I have two kids, so I work a little bit less. I say my average is probably around 60, maybe, yeah, somewhere around 60 hours a week right now. And that is of course very important. I've said this before that, um, if somebody wants to be an entrepreneur and they can't comfortably and consistently work, 50 to 60 hours a week, I would probably, I would say that's a, definitely a strike against them. It wouldn't be, a, I think, a deciding factor. It's not the litmus test, but I would say eh, you might want to consider just getting a job um, because it's just, if, if, you, if you want to just build a lifestyle business that makes a little bit of money, um, that gives you some freedom to travel and live modestly, then you probably could do that on, you know, maybe 30, 40 hours a week of work if you really know what you're doing and you have other skills, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, but if you want to build uh, an eight, nine plus figure business, it's just not going to happen in, in, unless it's the unicorn, right? Unless, oh, you just came out, you just made Snapchat, you win or whatever. Um, but if it's a more traditional type of uh, business, it just, it just takes a lot of time. And then it also takes a lot of you, – you, it takes a lot of the right work. It's not just working hard. I wouldn't say it's working quote-unquote smart, but it's working – you got to be able – you got to know – you got to do the right things well enough because you can put in a lot of time working and doing the wrong things or doing the right things not well enough and not get there. So there are um, – you know, like marketing, for example, marketing is tremendously important, especially in today's modern economy, where you have massive companies in pretty much every vertical um, who have very good marketing. They spend a lot of money, and people expect. I mean, the level of salesmanship that it takes to sell people now is a lot higher than it was decades ago. Um, and if you go back far enough, if you just look at actually popular ads, just go back in time every look, I don't know, every 30 years or so, see what kind of ads were, were the best ads that, that made the most money or just, just get a, an idea of kind of the, the general spirit of the marketing of that time and just go back another 30, go back another 30. You'll find that it's uh, similar to most things and that things were, it, it just was less sophisticated. The quality was lower it was easier um, to 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 make it. It was easier to to gain traction, and so I think, and that's just a natural consequence of of time and of a lot of smart people working in a field and continuing to advance the uh, the art and the science and the their understanding of how to do it better. So, Mark, if you're not, if you don't enjoy marketing, for example, if you don't enjoy figuring out how to sell people things, I would highly recommend not getting into business for yourself. And I would highly recommend um, finding what it is that you do enjoy doing and seeing if you can work for someone else doing that. Because again, unless you, it's some weird kind of exception, out, out, extraordinary type of circumstance, the vast majority of small businesses are going to live and die on the back of salesmanship. And if the founder isn't good at selling his own product or service, that's, in, in my opinion, basically a death sentence. 
In fact, I think the founder slash usually becomes the CEO if it, if the group grows. Um, should probably remain one of the best salespeople. And to, I mean, of course, you get into massive companies, and then the role of the CEO changes, and it's more about managing the workforce and the culture and strategic partnerships and so forth. But until you get to that point, the CEO. Um, I think needs to remain somebody who's very in touch with customers. Um, and I guess actually that point's even relevant to, to very large companies. So you can, I've read some examples recently of CEOs from very large companies that have gone out of their way to go spend time with actual customers and observe them. And so it's a marketing function, um, but that's very important in the beginning in, in business. So again, marketing is a key thing. You, if you want to give yourself the best chances of success, you should, spend as much time as you can. You should be able to, you should push yourself to study and practice marketing and, and really track your results, approach it scientifically, uh, figure out how to profitably sell your products and services. That should be your first priority. Many people don't like marketing though. They don't like selling because probably mostly because it's hard and that's it. And uh, I don't think many people admit that that's the reason why they don't like it. They'll say, oh, they just, you know, makes them feel dirty or it makes them feel like it's, it's kind of like a selling is a, is beneath them. It's not an honorable thing. It, it requires, um, you know, breaking your integrity or something. And all, all that's bullshit. It's not true. Uh, I think the primary reason why most people don't like marketing is because it's hard. That's the only reason. And yes, it is hard. It's hard to get good. It requires a lot of time. It requires a lot of study. It requires a high level of empathy. You have to be able to put yourself in someone else's shoes. You have to be willing to... It requires also quite a bit of drudgery in, in the research phase of things, in the market research phase of things. If you want to try to sell something to someone, you need to really understand them. And to understand them, that can require doing a lot of interviews with people. It can require you know going on to websites like Quora or or Reddit or forum websites and just spending time just observing the types of things they say and being being curious, right? And I think curiosity is something that is has been uh, almost killed in at least here in the West in our in our modern culture of just never ending stimulation and never ending entertainment where you can just passively consume without ever creating anything, including a thought. Um, so if that that uh, if willing willing to work very hard and willing to become a good marketer, those things bode very well. Um, and if if you can't check both of those boxes, then I would say you probably shouldn't be in business for yourself. Awesome. Uh, so there are two topics you brought up here. One is the working card element, which I definitely want to get into because um, it's pretty clear just from following you that you have a almost like a supernatural ability to just grind. But the other one is the skill component and getting really good at something. And I heard you mention earlier that if you want to maximize your chances of success, then you should really spend a lot of time getting so good at a specific skill that you can be ignored. Um, would you say that for an entrepreneur or someone who wants to succeed in business that it would be that, uh, marketing and getting really good at understanding people and sales and, and that kind of stuff? Yeah, absolutely. I would say, and that that's probably... That's top on the list if you're selling a thing, right? So if your thing doesn't, there are things that come along that that almost sell themselves, and that's true. Uh, you know, take the story of Spanx, for example, or I read about something recently called Keep Cup, which was like a a coffee cup that was was fashionable, but also was built in a way that baristas actually liked to use it. And um, there are a few other examples that I recently read about of products that grew mostly by word of mouth because they were they 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 really addressed uh and spanx is a much bigger example than keep cup and spanx is a perfect example something that addressed a serious pain point for women in a simple and effective way and it just sold itself well, it really was just get it the the plan was like get this into uh women's hands and watch how watch how much word of mouth occurs because women uh and this is just by there's research on this. The data shows that women are much more likely to, you know, tell their friends and tell their people about uh, products they like or or don't like than men. And so, for most of us, that you know, even for me, when when you get into business, you don't have even with Legion, for example, um, it, the, the the products are very good and it does have an interesting USP, but it required good marketing to sell. So yes, I would say that's probably one of the first skills uh, that you have to get very very good at. 
uh, you have to get good enough to where you are able to um, stand out, and that and that that is a that is a function of of marketing. And um, if your if what you're selling also has a technical skill component to it, which um, in the case of selling supplements, no, there's no technical uh, skill that. Well, I guess there's there's creating the formulations, but I knew how much time and effort it would take to become a true expert at the level that I wanted to have creating my formulations. So instead, I went and found that person and just worked with them. Um, but let's say you're a let's say you're a coach, and I would say you. I like the kind of minimum viable product approach to business, which if you are not familiar with that, anybody listening, just check out the book, uh, The Lean Startup by Eric Reese, or yeah, it's Reese, R-E-I-S. And basically in the beginning, when you're initially offering a product or service, it needs to be good enough. It needs to be good, solid, good value. You're not, you're not ripping people off. You're not um, selling them something that you wouldn't sell to your friends or your family. But you shouldn't expect it to be perfect in the beginning, first and foremost, because you don't even know what perfect is in the beginning. You have to, the market has, the marketplace, your, your customers need to need to tell you. You might have ideas, uh, but no matter how astute you are and no matter how attuned you are to your market, you will not think of everything that um, in the right order of priorities. And so what you want though, is you want something that addresses, again, you're, you're, you're solving a problem. Ideally, this is a problem you have had yourself. It's something that you understand that you can empathize with and you are scratching your own itch, so to speak. That's the, that's my story is scratching my own itches. Really. I wrote bigger than you stronger to scratch my own itch. I created my supplement company to scratch my own itch and make the stuff that I wish other people would have been making. Um, and I, I, launched an app because I scratched my own itch. I wanted the app that I wanted. And if enough of uh, other people have the problem, and if you've done a good enough job addressing it, then you will get early adopters, even if it's not perfect. And Bigger Than You're Stronger was not perfect. I, I would, If I read the first edition that I published now, I would hate it simply because I'm a much better writer now. I know a lot more now. And you know, I just recently rewrote from scratch the second edition, which I wrote four years ago, and I'm publishing a third edition. It'll be out this month, this month slash next, the digital uh, ebook and audiobook will be out. And then the hard copies will be out March or April, simply because we have to sell through the current stock of second editions so we can switch over to the third. But I recently rewrote it from scratch because I, I, I first I started with the second edition thinking I could edit it. And as I started going through it, edit it, update it, and then I was like, "Nah, I just need to. I, I don't. I don't like this at all. Now I'm going to reorganize this. I'm going to make it clear. I'm going to make it more practical. I'm going to take stuff out that probably doesn't. It's good information, but probably doesn't need to be there. And I'm going to replace it with information that more directly addresses people's questions and concerns because I hear from people every single day, and I keep uh, an ongoing list of changes that I should make to my books, um, which mostly come from readers. Although I do have my own ideas here and there that I throw in there." And so, um, that process of, uh, of starting with something that is good enough and then iterating on it over time makes a lot of sense to me. And it's, it's something that I have done from the beginning. And so that, that helps you avoid the paralysis by analysis. It helps you avoid the never, the interminable kind of beginning, which could just be demotivating when, you know, you have a thousand hours of work ahead of you before you even are going to get feedback from a single user or customer. Like that's kind of, uh, sh sure, there are some things that necessitate that. Uh, but for most of what we want to do, it's really not necessary. We should be prioritizing speed because uh, you want to know fast. If, you know, you've heard this before. If you're going to fail, fail fast. And um, I I think that's a good, I think, I think that's good advice. I think that's generally good advice. Um, and I wouldn't actually go into something assuming it's going to fail, but I would go into something assuming that there are going to be some things people are going to like, and there are going to be some things that people are not going to like, but that's your starting point. So you go, great. You get your initial feedback. You have your minimum viable product, bigger than or stronger. Also in terms of, I think it was initially maybe 60,000 words, give or take some, and now it's 130,000 words. And that, it, that has that the expansion of the book was in response to feedback where people would ask questions and they would say things in, in reviews, which I still go through, especially the negative ones. Um, the three star and two and one, those are the ones I'm most interested in. Um, 
And a lot of that came when I was like, oh, that's a good point. I should add that information. Oh, I should address that as well. I should address that as well. Uh, um, there is a point where you have to stop because if the book gets too big, it becomes mm, daunting and, and then your your readership dwindles. But I think there is a sweet spot in terms of size. And that's at the top of it. I, I, I can't go any further. And further additions, if I want to add things, I'm going to have to cut. I, I don't want it to turn into a tome that you know, people, you know, no matter how much good information is there, they just can't bring themselves to start it because it's such a commitment. Um, so that's, that's, I think a key, uh, a, I think it's just a very, a very rational and time proven way to get into business. And so the amount of technical skill that it takes to create a minimum viable product for anything is usually fairly low. And for most people wanting to just get in the business, get into some sort of business, it is going to be fairly low. Even if it's, let's say it's coaching, let's say it's fitness coaching. How much do you need to know to offer a, and, and if I were getting into coaching from scratch, um, I mean, I'd have to put more thought into this exactly what my plan would be, but it would be a minimum viable service. Uh, maybe it would be something around diet coaching uh, because that's also easiest to learn. And training, there are a bit more var variables. You have to be a you have to be a bit more of an expert. You need to have a bit more technical knowledge to be uh, good at programming someone's training and coaching them through a training program than you do a diet. Um, and at least at least if you're just going to be serving everyday people who just want to lose a bit of weight and they want to gain a bit of muscle and look and feel better, and I would probably just offer it for free in the beginning because my goal would be to uh, get testimonials. So I that that would be my ask for the people, I would take on, let's say, you know, 50, 50 clients for free or whatever. Uh, I'd probably just do it until I have a certain number of testimonials. I'd probably want at least 10 testimonials. Um, and I'll, I would work with them for free for a few months with the agreement that if I do a good job, they will give me before and after they'll take pictures, progress pictures throughout, and they will write uh, like a kind of, you know, success story for me and do some sort of interview, ideally like a Skype uh, video interview. So there's real proof there that this person's real. These aren't just pictures on the internet with some text. Um, and then now you have something, I would say that's probably a, a minimum viable product uh, in terms of marketing. You have a minimum viable marketing package. Now you have a service you have, here's, here are the benefits of the service. Here are the features. Here's what you're going to, here's what you're going to get. And here's social proof that this service works. Start cheap. I, if I was you know starting out, I would not be trying to ask much money. Again, it would just be the idea is get that flywheel spinning, start gaining traction. Um, when I published Bigger Leaner Stronger, for example, I published it at 99 cents because I didn't care about making money in the beginning. It was just, I don't even know if anyone's going to buy the book. And at 99 cents, it sold 20 copies in the first month. So, um, so that, I mean, that's, yeah, you, you have uh, willing to work hard, long hours and don't get distracted and, you know, whatever. I mean, that's something we could talk about if you want to talk more about that. But then, be good enough at marketing and be good enough at whatever technical skill you need to, pr to actually produce the product or service. That's, I think, the um, surest path to at least the beginnings of success. Awesome. That's uh, super actionable and uh, super interesting. So just to wrap up the marketing theme, uh, how did you like, how would you go about it yourself? If you wanted to learn about it as much as possible, would you l read books or would you take uh, a course or there are some, I know that you are personal friends with Neil Patel, who is a great guy in marketing. Like how would you go about it uh, yourself? Yeah. So, um, I'll say uh, someone, well, let's take out, let's, let's take out Neil because, uh, the only reason I know Neil and is, is because I've, I've had some success. So if I were just starting out, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to get any help from him, even though he's a super helpful guy. He gets so many requests. You know, he, uh, I'm impressed that he even replies to my emails quickly if I email him, <laughs> but, um, books, books is the best place to start. Like I would say, um, well, I mean, what do you have out there? You have books, you have articles, you have podcasts, um, sure, you have courses, but courses I generally would stay away from unless they were part of, unless they were reasonably priced. I, especially with marketing, I would stay away from the internet marketer guru people who sell thousand, two thousand, five thousand dollar courses and say this is this this is the secret sauce. This is how you how you make to millions. Uh, I'd stay away from all of those guys. 
if if we're talking courses, I would be interested in things that are maybe on something like the great courses, maybe Udemy. I know that that's just a kind of a self-publishing platform. So quality is going to be all over the place. You have a lot of open source university stuff out there. I would be looking at, um, can I take some some marketing courses from colleges for free? I'm sure you can. And then you, then you have books, of course. And so for me, I have a good example. When I got into golf, um, my, my tentative goal in the beginning was basically my overarching um, condition was I'm only going to play golf if I can get good because I don't like doing things that I'm not good at. And for me, that's the, the scorecard is literally the scorecard. It's not just going out and having a good time. And there are many people that play golf. That's why they enjoy golf. They don't give a shit about their score. They don't even necessarily keep score. Um, and they don't play the game by the rules. If they're out there, just have a good time. They're out there to hang out with their friends and have a few beers and hit a few good shots. And I understand that. I, I just, that's just not, that wasn't, that wasn't, appealing to me, at least, uh, as far as golf goes. Sure. I like hanging out, but golf, if I'm going to, I just grew up playing sports. I think I'm too competitive as a person to, to do that. So I was uh, saying, okay, I, if I'm going to do this, I need to be able to get good. And what's good, play some golf. You get an idea of if you are at a 10 handicap or below to me, that's good. That's where you're actually playing the game. Once you start getting above 10, you are, playing the game less and less, really, you're kind of just struggling and scrambling around. And that wasn't enjoyable. So the question was, if I was willing to give golf a few hours a week, which is what I was willing to give it uh, to start, maybe on average five to six hours a week, I'd go out there Sunday afternoons for usually I'd get there around 12 or one. And this is when I was living in Florida. So most of the year, it didn't get dark until, I don't know, seven, eight or later. So I was out there all afternoon and I started with educating myself. Okay. So what, what, what does it take to get really good at this sport? And so I read, uh, I mean, I can, I continue to read. So over the course of the first year, year and a half, I read probably 30 books on golf and I just started with what are the classics? That's where I, when I want to educate myself in an, in an area, I go to who are the people who made the original discoveries who are like the real pioneers of the field. And let's start there and see if I can, what I can learn in the way of first principles before I go to later stuff that is kind of the, in, that are embroiderments on, on, on the early stuff. So in the, in the case of golf, it was uh, Ben Hogan's stuff. It was, Oh yeah, this was years ago. Ben Hogan is the one that comes to mind first. Um, anyways, I don't know. Sam Sneed might have written, shit i don't i don't remember exactly but i kind of looked at the the timeline the the chronology of of the education side of golf and who 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 were the guys that that made the 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 real breakthroughs in terms of swing mechanics and just how the game is played i just studied their stuff and you know i when i study it's or when i read i approach it like studying um i'm reading very actively i'm highlighting i'm making notes in the marginalia. I mean, I read digitally uh, whenever possible. So the notes are just saved in my my device, uh, in the cloud, actually. And um, I clarify words that I don't know in a dictionary and even words that I think I might know. I often check just because I'm curious. And that also helps in my writing. It's, I think, the better your vocabulary is, the better your life actually is. But that's another discussion. I've written about that and, and spoken about that. Um, so, so, so that's how I go about it. Right. And so I, I read in the beginning uh, a number of books until I felt like, okay, I see now a path, a path of how to get good at golf. And a few things stood out in terms of the mechanics of the swing that made a lot of sense to me in terms of swing plane and swing path and how you want to be striking the ball. Ultimately, that's what matters the most. Obviously everything set up, uh, takeaway transition, it all comes down to the point of impact. Of course, if you can get to the proper point of impact consistently, you can hit the ball well, but there are uh, higher and low, lower probability or uh, more and less workable and consistently repeatable ways of doing that. And so then I, then I, so I concluded early on that to get there, I need to have a very good long game. A lot of people get into golf, for example, and I know this because I played a lot of golf, um, where they had, they've always, there are like these 
everybody knows, right? These kind of um, uh, aphorisms that people say like, oh, you, you drive for show and you putt for dough. And everybody knows that you got to have a really, really good short game. That's really what you should be working on is, you know, you're putting and on and around the greens. And there was a book called Every Shot Counts, I believe. Mark Brody, a uh, professor from Brown University, I think a statistics professor, very, that, that was a great book. And he, he just shows with, with data, with scientific analysis, that that's actually not true. If the number one thing you want to achieve, if you want to be good at golf, if you want to be able to shoot in the seventies, put up real scores, uh, play in tournaments, you ha- you need to be able to hit the ball far. That's number one. And he breaks down why in the book and has a lot of data to show it. He's like, figure out your distance first and then, and then work on your accuracy, do it that way. Um, especially if you want to be at like a tour, if you want to be tr- a professional golfer and you can't at least, and I'm sure this number has gone up since you wrote the book. I'm positive it has at the time. It was, if you could not drive the ball at least 270 yards, don't even try it, it, The data shows you will not make it on tour period. Um, so in the beginning I do, I do a fair amount of study until I have a plan, a plan that makes sense to me. Here's the goal, right? What's the purpose of this goal? Why do I care? And what's the plan? I don't start doing anything until I have that plan. In the beginning, it is make the plan. It is not just start getting into random motion and do random things that feel like maybe I'm making progress and make me feel good that I'm in action, but are actually getting me nowhere or either running around in circles or maybe going in the exact opposite direction that I should be going in. And so with marketing, I would approach it the same way. I would read like Cialdini's influence. I would read um, Hopkins. Uh, it is uh, scientific advertising and my life in advertising, I believe, uh, Claude Hopkins books. Um, I would read, you're going to have to, probably going to have to understand a bit about copywriting, right? So I'd read Eugene Schwartz. I would find a, a PDF of his breakthrough advertising online, unless you want to pay $400 or something for a, for a hard copy. And again, this is like, the standard read, read capels, just read the, the old school guys that, that pioneered, that really made the breakthroughs. That's all you really, really need. If you can just understand the fundamentals and execute them well, you are so far, you are far beyond the average marketer that you will be competing against, unless you are in some crazy, sophisticated, hyper-competitive field where You know, maybe there are some areas of tech, for example, where the average marketing is just really top notch, but in most industries, and that's, that's also something that you can think with in terms of looking for an opportunity. If you ever see, if you have an industry, if you have a a marketplace where you have a lot of competition, you have a lot of activity, a lot of spending, a lot of customers, but the general quality of marketing is just kind of shitty. That's a big opportunity because if you can just come in with the exact same product or service, it doesn't even have to be better. Um, you can make it better. I'm not saying you shouldn't, but it it could be the exact same product or service, but you're a better marketer. You are going, you have, you can do, you can do well. Uh, you know, so let's say it's like pool sales or something. I don't know, whatever it is, it doesn't even matter. uh, A lot of people spend money on pools. I'm sure that, uh, it's, it's a, it's a decent market and I would be surprised if, the, the marketing were very sophisticated, just for example. I might be wrong. Maybe maybe uh, enough people have caught on in that industry, but I, there are just so many opportunities out there. Um, so reading, let's say, I don't know, 10 to 20 books is probably a good start. Um, I would say any less than 10, f- any less than five. And if you, if, you, like, if you can't commit to reading five books on marketing, then don't, there's just, you're, you're not going to ever be a good marketer, in my opinion. D- I don't know how, how you got to, because marketing is also an interesting thing in that it is a creative endeavor and it's something that you have to really enjoy to be very good at in my, and that's, that's, I'm just speaking from experience here. I'm not quoting someone. Um, but I think the same is true with other creative activities, with writing, with painting with making music it just requires the the creation that side of it requires uh a constant exertion of effort in a way that most people are are averse to and if you don't like it it's going to be very hard to will yourself if you don't feel naturally drawn to it and naturally curious and naturally wanting to 
put your attention into it, put your time into it and put your creativity into it. Um, it is not likely to go well. So again, that would, that would kind of be a, a, a make break test is if, if somebody were to read five books on marketing and they, the, the thought of reading a sixth book makes them sick to their stomach. Uh, I would, I would stop and reconsider the entire plan. Um, because marketing is one of those things that if I were to, I think I even have a list on my computer, I would say there's probably a, a good 20 books or so that I think everyone who wants to be good at marketing should not only read, but uh, really absorb, apply, probably reread in a lot of cases. There's just so much good information in those books. Um, so that's so that would be the starting point, right? And and as you're going through the, the initial study period, you're building your plan. You're making notes. You're going things that stand out to you where, where you go, Ooh, that makes sense. Oh, here's how I could, here's how I could use that to sell my, my coffee mugs. Um, and so you're piecing your plan together on, on how you're going to bring this thing to the market. And, um, yeah, I'd say that that's a good start. And, and from there knowing yeah, from there, from there, it can go off in many directions, but that's a good starting, uh, good starting point. Awesome, excellent. Uh, so that's that's the marketing side of things. And as far as the hard work side of things go, you mentioned some figures in the beginning, like seventy hours, or you know, at minimum like sixty. Um, like, how do those sixty to seventy hours look like for you? Like, how much of that is things like email, some chore work, and how how many of that is like some deep, uh, especially creative type work, like writing, uh, especially in the beginning, because now you have your hands in a lot of different things. Uh, but especially initially, like how did those 70 hours break down for yourself? Yeah. So it has changed over time as I have added businesses, uh, because that just, you know, there's uh, the, the number one skill uh, based on my experience um, and based on what I've, what I've studied as far as building a business goes is I would say probably well summarized in the book E-Myth by Michael Gerber is building systems. The better, and it's something I've noticed, people who are more systems thinkers tend to be better business people, better managers, better executives than people who don't naturally think that way. Uh, there's, I was actually just talking with one of the, one of the guys that works with me about this and that's not entirely surprising, um, because really what, what you want in the end, if you're going to be starting a business is what you don't want is you don't want another job that is just more stressful than what you, than your current job that has more responsibilities and makes you less money, but is quote unquote yours. And you have quote unquote freedom to quote unquote, do whatever you want. What you want is a business that, while it might be that in the beginning that over time, a lot that it, it it makes it makes you more and more passive income. It makes you more and more money regardless of what you do. Now you could continue working on the business to continue growing it, or you could work on something else, or you could split your time between things, or you could take it easy or whatever. Uh, but to get to that point, you have to be very good at building systems in your business that ordinary people can run. And I don't mm. say that ordinary people, like I'm not an ordinary person, but that's actually from Michael Gerber. That's how he talks about it. What you don't want is a business that requires extraordinary people. You want a business that has extraordinary systems that can be run well by ordinary people. And so that means you have to be that person to build those systems. You can't ever think that you're just going to find somebody else who can do all that work for you. And uh, so learning to be a systems thinker and learning to be able to envision how you go from A to Z, how you go to to envision a goal, uh, and and go, okay, this is this is here's what here's what we're what we're going after, and be able to paint a picture, not just oh, a lot of money. No, paint a picture in terms of be a bit more specific, and uh, and then more importantly, though, anybody can do that. That's that's not hard to say where we want to go is not hard, but. To go, okay, now where am I at currently and what needs to be done? Broad strokes. This is strategic thinking, strategy. How can I get from here to there? There are, of course, many, many ways it could be done. So it's not even, you don't have to worry about finding the best way or the perfect way because that trying to yeah. maximize at a strategic level, I think it doesn't matter how smart you are or how good of a strategic thinker you are, it is going, it's just going to lead to that paralysis by analysis problem because 
it's hard to, you can't ever know what's the best way you could, you could spend a thousand hours crafting your strategic plan and it still might not, might not be the best one. It's probably, is not the best. It probably, there probably is something that could be improved about it. Something that you didn't think of something that, uh, whether that you, you just didn't foresee a problem or you didn't, you didn't see an opportunity. It's like, you know, chess there, when you're faced with, with a chess uh, not, not a problem because those are usually like one way to solve, but just a, a certain scenario. And there are so many different possible moves you can make, right? So you just need something that's good enough. It could be excellent. That could be your, your standard could be excellent, but good enough means that it's going to work. It's going to get you to where you want to be in a reasonable amount of time for a reason. And it's going to cost a reasonable amount of money and, and it's going to require a reasonable amount of effort. So that's when I'm thinking strategically, I don't get too much into the weeds of, um, oh, well, I need to iterate on this strategy more and more and more to make it quote unquote the best. And if you are, uh, starting at, at that point, then, so in, in terms of the, the work, then it is kind of comes off of, of the, the strategies, right? And as far as, you know, building the businesses go, there's been more and more of, uh, that, that, that I've had to, that I've had to been, had to be involved in. And, um, I, one way that I've found that works in terms of dealing with it is being very specific with my time. So I have a very specific schedule that I follow where I have my time, time blocked. And, um, you know, early on it was the, the strategy was mostly revolving around me just creating content, creating as much content as I can and making it as good as I possibly can. So that was writing, that was recording podcasts, recording videos. And, um, as I added businesses, um, I've had to take on more and more business related work. And most of that work has been regarding systems though. Like uh, instead of taking tasks that now I'm going to have to do that forever, it's taking tasks, figuring out, okay, what's the system here? How do we make this work? And then finding someone I can give it to. So I'm going through that process right now with my social media, for example, I've neglected social media to my detriment, uh, but I've neglected it completely, at least I would say willingly. Um, but I think it's time to stop doing that. And so what I'm doing is I'm working through someone that works with me and we're putting together the system. That's the first thing. We're not just randomly kind of posting things and coming up with ideas and going with, you know, um, whatever kind of whimsical inspirations might occur to us. We are systematically breaking down each, okay, each piece of this whole puzzle and how do we want this to work? We're creating, you know, that means there's a rotation that we follow in terms of, we're going to be following in terms of types of posts on certain days on certain platforms. And then for those types of posts, what are some, what are the ideas? So let's say it's a promotional post. Good. So how, what are we going to be promoting and why? Okay. We need to create a rotation a, pro or a promotional rotation that uh, favors books over products. And why do we want to do that? Well, there are reasons for that. Okay. So now we know that we want to be promoting books on this schedule, which we're building out on a calendar. How are we going to promote those books? What types of images do we need? How are we going to get the captions? Okay. What's this workflow? How does it look in terms of checklists and how does it flow from uh, the idea to the finished post that is then promoted, blah, blah, blah. So it's really taking the time to build out the system and it's pretty time intensive, but then I will be able to give it to anyone who is just willing to work and who's smart enough and who cares enough, and they'll be able to do a very good job. They'll be able to uh, run social media very competently. That's a much better way of going about it than me trying to find someone who, I mean, the worst would just be finding someone uh, that says, oh yeah, I'll do your social media. And then I just give it to them. And there are no KPIs in place. There's no systems in place. There's nothing. And I go, cool, figure it out. That's the laziest way to run a business and will never work. Um, you need someone who is good at doing what I just spoke about. And it's going to have to be you in the beginning and who will do it in every area of the business. And so a lot of my work in my businesses comes down to stuff like that. It's diving into certain areas and saying, Hey, what's, what's the system here? Let me see it. How's, how does it work? Okay. Um, here are, you know, my ideas on how we can improve this. What do you think? Okay. Let's get this more organized. Let's get this, uh, let's make this better. And the, when you 
that the, those effects compound over time across the whole business to where you, you know, you do that for years and years and years, and you're going to have a very, um, well-developed, a very intricate, but workable machine. And so currently, uh, like I have my time block. So what I do is I have a schedule that I've, uh, it's Monday through Sunday. And I go on like a four week rotation because a lot of my time still is spent. I'd say, um, I don't know, a half, maybe th- a third of my time is spent creating content for muscle for life, creating, uh, articles mostly. And, and also for Legion and then recording my podcast, doing podcast interviews like this. And, um, yeah, those oh, there's some YouTube stuff in there as well. And so because we publish on a, on different rotations, so like one week, it'll be a long form article on Legion and an article update on MFL, which you do to, to improve your SEO and protect your rankings. And then the next week it will flip and MFL will get a long form article from me and Legion will get an update. Right. And, um, so there are other types of articles. We have book club, we have the motivation Monday, and it's all laid out though in, in, um, it's a spreadsheet that anyone could look at and understand and go, oh, okay, cool. This is the system. This is how we run the publishing side of things. And so then my week one, like for example, Monday, I, I just kind of go in morning time block, like morning. And then I have my email standard time block 12 to one and then afternoon and then evening are, uh, and I have some standing appointments, some staff meeting things and some things that, you know, uh, don't change that are at the same time, more or less every week. And so week one, um, in the nine to 12, kind of in the morning block, I will be working on a Legion long form article. And what that means is the first week of every month. That's how I run it for. And then, you know, you have an extra week here and there and that's fine. You just, you just adjust. And, uh, week two though, that time block, I'll be working on the MFL long form article. And cause I have these things, I have my checklist of things I need to get done every week and I haven't prioritized. So the top priority things are the content. And cause that's really the, the main pillar that drives my businesses is content. So it would, I think it's still the highest and best use of my time. Um, and then, and then I have the afternoon block, which again, I'm, I'm really, what I'm doing is I'm front loading. I'm getting through all the most important stuff first in my week and prioritizing that. And then I have open slots for working on other things. So it's Thursday and, um, this is week two. And so my, morning slot on a Thursday, uh, on a week two, and this is assuming everything is running normally. Of course, there are fires sometimes and there are things that necessitate changes and you got to shift things around and you, and you just do it. But it's much easier to do that and be okay with it when you understand where you're at every week with the things. What are the most important things that you need to get done this week? You might find that Oh, you already got the most important things done. So it's totally fine that you, you wanted to work on this, this uh, other project. And for me, like an other project right now would be, I'm working on a second edition of my, my book beyond bigger, leaner, stronger, which is the sequel to, to bigger, leaner, stronger, but I'm, I'm saving that to, for, a, for an open time slot. I'm not going to take away from an MFL article, for example, to work on that because I did that, uh, earlier last year when I was rewriting bigger, leaner, stronger and thinner, leaner, stronger. And I, and I, it was a conscious decision though. And I was okay with it where I was like, Hmm, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to fuck my publishing schedule all up and I'm like not going to publish much at all on the blogs for a couple months while I rewrite these books because I think strategically that makes more sense than dragging these things out and making them take uh, three times as long. And so that's what I did. However, with Beyond Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, strategically, it's not as important as Bigger, Leaner, Stronger and Thinner, Leaner, Stronger. And it's okay if I get it done sometime in Q1, even going into Q2 is actually okay. Um, So you know, my morning uh, and my afternoon slots on week two Thursdays are open. So that's why it's a good time for me to do stuff like this. And um, so I pretty much, you know, I have that laid out even with some personal stuff on when I wake up, what I do first thing in the morning, um, when I go to the gym and, and when I study. So I spend uh, about an hour to an hour and a half a day studying. And even on the weekends, I have some simple you know, I have some things that I, that I get done every weekend, um, work related things. And then I have some family time and I have a, a standing, go have some fun on Sunday afternoons, which sometimes just turns into work. So that's what I feel like doing. Um, but approaching 
my life this way has been, I wouldn't even say instrumental. I would say absolutely vital, really. I mean, it's been, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to juggle as many balls as I juggle without doing this. I wouldn't be able to, some people might be able to, uh, but it just got trying to keep it all in my head. Uh, and it, it got, it got, it got very annoying and it got frustrating. So this was my solution, uh, which is similar to some of the stuff that David Allen talks about in getting things done. I, I use a system similar to his, um, to track my, my ongoing work. So I have like, what am I getting done today? What needs to get done this week? Um, what am I staying on top of? What are the things that are like in progress? I need to stay on top of because it's off to someone else. What are, and I have like the immediate, you know, weekly you need to stay on top of these things that need to get done. Then I have my kind of general in progress. I don't expect these to be done in the next week or so to stay on top of my daily do slash review, my weekly do slash review, my monthly do slash review, and then my future stuff. Um, so I've always found that organization it, it just, it's kind of like a force mul multiplier when, when the more organized that I've become myself personally and in my businesses, the more I've been able to get done, the better the results have been, the faster the businesses have been able to grow, the more painlessly the businesses have been able to grow. Um, and it, and then it also makes it easier to work a lot because I can really say that I know everything I'm doing every day there's a reason I'm doing it. It fits into an overall strategic plan that I've put thought into and I do believe will get me to a goal that I care about. That's inherently motivating as opposed to uh, doing, to spending time working on things that may or may not get anywhere that haven't really been tied into any bigger picture in terms of a plan that are going toward a goal that isn't really clarified or even motivating that, you know, I'm not excited about Ray Dalio says in principles, just very bluntly, if you're not excited about a goal, stop working for it. And I 100% agree with that. If you're not genuinely excited about whatever it is that you are working toward, you need to find something else to work toward, or you need to re uh, frame it yourself. You need to be able to feel that excitement um, because there's just, it's going to require that you do a lot of things that you don't want to do inherently, that you don't just wake up saying, oh, I really want to grind on uh, this today. Um, and writing is even sometimes like that. I enjoy writing generally. I enjoy having written, but I don't always enjoy the process. Sometimes it's a pain in the ass. Sometimes it takes even 20 or 30 minutes for me to really feel like I'm getting into a groove and I'm not just writing things that I, I'm not, it's that I'm not just kind of, uh, wading through quicksand, you know, waist deep. Um, and, but if you have that underlying excitement, that's always there because of it's what that writing means, what does it connect to? It makes it much easier to just keep going until it gets enjoyable. And I find that's the case with most work. It's very rare for me, at least to, um, do anything for more than maybe 10 or 15 minutes before I start enjoying it. Yeah. I, I learned uh, through listening to podcasts with you that asking questions like, how do you overcome procrastination or whatever insecurities is probably not the best question to ask from you. <laughs> but uh, do you never have that moment when you're writing something and it's just like, man, I just don't have the creative resources and juices flowing, like just nothing is coming out. Because I'm sure you notice the difference too. Like sometimes you wake up in the morning, you have some caffeine and everything is just flowing beautifully. And other times it's just dry and it probably comes across in your writing as well you you do you have that ever no no i'm kidding of course <laughs> <laughs> yeah of course i uh but i i just keep going i just don't care i just don't let it stop me i'm not gonna let that get in the way hmm. like that that's it i just go yeah too bad keep going too bad keep going it's like in the gym of course we all have workouts we're in the middle of a workout and we're like ah this sucks <laughs> it's just, every, the weight everything feels heavy and maybe you didn't sleep enough maybe there's a good reason why it sucks and sometimes there's no reason why it sucks it's just a shitty workout and sometimes that you'll have a string of shitty workouts it'll you'll have shitty workouts yeah. for a month for two months um i've been there uh, and but you just keep going and that's that's been my solution i don't think about it i don't really tr internalize anything or try to talk. I, I just keep going and I, I've kind of built that habit, I guess. Maybe, maybe that's, that's why, but, uh, this kind of comes to 
something that I think is also um, a very valuable trait, which is the ability to suffer. And um, I think that a lot of us have lost that ability. I know it's it's cliche to say, oh, you know, in our modern luxurious times, we've become soft, blah, blah, blah. But, and, and there's a market for that. You have a lot of usually ex Navy SEAL guys who that's their entire shtick. But I think there's actually a lot of truth to that. I don't, I don't know if I'm a, a tough person. Honestly, I don't know. I feel like I haven't been challenged enough. I haven't been faced with a situation that to me was, uh, was overwhelming and where I really, really, really wanted to just give up. And that's probably partly through circumstances of how I grew up. And for me working, come on, we're, I'm, I sit in a fucking climate controlled room every day in my fancy ergonomic chair and my fancy type on my fancy mechanical keyboard with my fancy big Dell monitors listening to whatever the fuck I want to listen to because I have a fancy Spotify subscription. There's just, I, I refuse to accept that that's hard. Oh, that's, that's tough because I sat in a fucking chair and used my fingers and my mind for 14 hours today. Fuck no, that's nothing. I think of the, there was research that was done on Sherpas uh, that help people climb Everest. And um, the, the things these people do, it, it makes no sense. Like you have guys that are carrying their body weight on their back uh, for hours and hours and hours trekking up this mountain. And so there was research that was done on them because the researchers, their, their high hypothesis was there's something physically different about these people that enables them to do what they do. Uh, they physically should not be able to, to do this, not be able to endure the amount that this should kill them. Like the, 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 the amount of effort that it takes to, to do what they do should actually just kill. It shouldn't be possible. And in the end, they found that there was actually, there were no discernible differences physically at all. They just kept going. They just refused <laughs> to give up. That's it. And sure, they, I'm sure they started at a young age and they were conditioned over time to, but in the end, what, what it came down to is they found that a lot of it was just psychological. And so I, uh, I, I, I have to maintain for myself very high standards in that regard and that I have disdain for complaining. I have disdain for um, quitting because it's hard and disdain for even, even what comes down to the, a lot of this vulnerability and it's very popular now, Bene Brown, and it's a thing where more and more people are quote unquote opening up and sharing their, their innermost problems, which I'm not going to name any names, but in some cases I am almost certain that the stories are fake. You have these stories of sexual assault with certain guys, um, suicidal ideation or even attempts. Uh, I know it sounds bad and it sounds cynical, but in a, in s certain cases, in several cases, I do not believe them. I don't believe them at all. They're, they're too insincere. You just get a sense you're listening to the person tell this story and you're like, you know, you just have intuitions and you go, this person's fucking lying. This is bullshit. And, and, oh, but they get so much praise for being so vulnerable. Sure. I think it's, it's fine to acknowledge that none of us are perfect. We all have weaknesses, but it's a totally different thing to try to use that as a crutch or use that as a, uh, as an excuse to fail and even worse to use that as to, to, to give other people excuses to fail or be weak, um, or to even worse to do it, to, to just get affection, to get likes, to get acknowledgement um, and all that comes down to uh, what I think is the biological imperative to survive. And if we really look at it, um, I think objectively, it, only for, for, for species to adapt and survive, which is, that's really what Darwin said, right? It's not survival of the fittest, but survival of, um, the, the species that are able to adapt the best. You, you gotta be tough to make it like, there's no. That's still, that's still, we haven't gotten to our communist utopia yet, unfortunately. Maybe, uh, maybe one day, yeah, right, not happening. But it still requires a lot of effort, um, even though it's not the same type of effort that you had to exert 
back in the, even if you just go back a hundred years and you know, go back hundreds of years and you, you just, you had to be tougher and tougher as you go back to survive. And I think that's still the case. Um, so for me, it's, uh, I, yeah, maybe that's the mindset that then allows me to maintain the right habits. So I don't get into a habit of just allowing myself to be constantly distracted or to let days kind of just, uh, disappear with busy work or, or worse, um, you know, disappear on social media, stuff like that. And it's, that would feel very, I'm sure I could, if I just forced myself to do enough of it, I'm sure I would come to enjoy it. And that would be what I'd be naturally drawn to. But I have intentionally stayed away from, um, uh, and it goes beyond like even just my habits in life. And I, and I write about this in my book, the little black book of workout motivation that for me personally, when I see what everyone else is doing really in any area of life, my instinct is to consider doing the exact opposite, literally the exact opposite. Uh, because when you look at most people, obviously we all fall on a bell curve, uh, in, in every way, really, that's just, that's just the standard distribution of, of whether you're talking about intelligence or conscientiousness or wealth. Well, I guess wealth falls a power distribution actually, but, um, and uh, let's say even just lifestyle, right? Most people tend to, um, just mirror the environment that they, that they're in. And if we look at what that is objectively, it's, it's not a very pretty sight when you just take the average person. And I don't say that. I mean, I'd say that if you want to look at that in terms of their physical fitness, their, their mental fitness, their, um, ability to work, their ability to be valuable to society. And I don't say that as an indictment of, of an, of the, of the everyday person. I much more blame the environment that we live in. I think most people really, I do think this, that if we lived in a better environment, an environment that was engineered to make happier, healthier, uh, more intelligent, more responsible, more curious people, we would have a lot more of them. I think that we live in an environment that has been deliberately engineered to produce the opposite. And then we have people that look at a system that has been created to produce what it is producing. And then we have people that, that place the blame on the quote unquote victims of the system. Uh, now, I, I don't, I think you have to also be careful in that where you go, oh, well, then it's just not their fault and, and there's nothing they can do about it. Um, I don't agree with that either. But my point is that it's not entirely, I wouldn't even say it's not only entire, not entirely fair, but it's not entirely correct and practical to just say, Oh, well, that person's just fucking fat and lazy and just needs to work harder, obviously. Even if that's objectively true, the how do you get there and addressing the environment? And, and, I, and I write about this. I have an article on Most for Life about this. And it's also it's an, a bonus chapter in my little black book for workout motivation that if you can engineer your environment to just naturally nudge you toward better behaviors and better habits and away from bad behaviors and away from things that are destructive, that is so much more effective than ignoring your environment and constantly trying to use willpower to overcome the temptations and overcome the, uh, and, and avoid the pitfalls that you uh, have to navigate around every day. Right. Uh, and we're going to wrap up in a minute, but I just uh, want to bring this up that I heard you mention somewhere that you took Jordan Peterson's personality test. And I don't know your results, but I would assume that you are a hyper conscientious, hyper industrious person. And, you know, one thing I've, I've been thinking about is that probably a lot of these uh, personality traits have a strong genetic component to them. And do you think that in a way that's been your freakish genetic gift? Like it's almost like the way Ronnie Coleman was built to be huge and just has a crazy potential for getting super muscular. In the same way, you have this almost supernatural ability to just work really, really hard. And it's almost it's almost like you are the Ronnie Coleman of hard work and putting out a lot of intellectual content without burning out. Um, there's probably a genetic component. There probably is an inborn component, almost certainly. Is it primarily that? I if I speak for myself, I haven't looked at the literature, uh, so I'm not sure what the data would say, but if I speak for myself, no, uh, I wasn't, I always was willing to work. 
but I wasn't uh, always super driven. I mean, I guess I, I had that element of my personality. So for example, I played a fair amount of sports growing up. I got into ice hockey and that's all I did. I was obsessive about ice hockey and read books and watched DVDs and went to camps. And, and so I had that element of my personality, like I was capable of doing that, but it definitely required though, that I found things that inspired me to do that. And that would still be the case now. I mean, I have responsibilities now that like I have a family. And so minimally I have the responsibility to make enough money, um, to, to feed my family and, and give them uh, a good life, financially speaking, at least. And um, of course, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just talking about the financial side of it. Uh, there are, I think, other responsibilities as far as being a father and a husband goes. But on the financial side of it, that means that even if, if this all fell apart, I would be very interested in doing something, figuring out something that allowed me to make enough money. Whereas before I had a family, when I was younger, um, before I was married, the idea, I wasn't very interested in money. Um, I'm not, I'm still not a very money, money motivated person. And so much so that when I was younger, the idea of just kind of like making a business to sell widgets was uninspiring to me. It wasn't interesting at all. Just selling things to make a profit. I'm, I'm more interested in the business side of things now because I have businesses and I can appreciate the work and creativity that goes into just selling things well. But um, early on, the idea of, oh, if you just sell a bunch of things profitably, you can have a lot of money. And with that money, you can have a lot of things wasn't very interesting to me. Um, so I had to find things that inspired my, that, you know, that, and that comes down to, I mentioned curiosity earlier, um, is very important, I think, because the more curious somebody is, and that can be cultivated as well. Even if somebody, for example, um, if someone's listening is they go, I'm just, I, they, if they say, I'm not a very curious person. Um, well, if you were to stop consuming media and entertainment for, um, a month and do simple exercises to stimulate curiosity, which you could find with one Google search very easily. I guarantee you that by the end of that month, you would be different, a lot different. And again, this comes back to the, the environment point that I was talking about. It's yes, it is hard to be curious if you spend hours a day on social media, uh, YouTube, uh, Netflix, and on video games. In fact, it's probably impossible. If that's what you're going to do, then just do that and stop stressing. Stop trying to become anything <laughs> because it's, why bother? Uh, and I don't even think there's anything necessarily wrong with that. I mean, I was talking about that again with, with some of my guys that I actually understand one of the guys that works with me, he has a friend who in his, in his high school years decided that he wasn't going to become financially successful. He didn't care about having a business. He didn't even care about having a job. All he cared about was just having adventures. That's what he wanted to do. And for me, I go, okay, that's not a life. I understand the exotic kind of romantic appeal of it, but that's not really a life that I would want to live, but um, to each their own. But to this guy's credit, that's what he has done. He's now, I don't know, in his mid to late 20s, he's had a lot of cool adventures. He's even worked with a couple companies along the way, uh, capturing them. I think Red Bull um, and I don't know, Nike or something. So he's, he's, he's figured out a way to just makes enough money to pay the bills. And he has no problem that he has no other ambitions. He has no goals other than just that. He has no plans. That makes sense to me. And he doesn't stress about it. He loves it. That's exactly, he's doing exactly what he wants to do, exactly what he intends to do. His intentions are in alignment with his actions and he's totally satisfied. That makes sense to me. I could see that. I could see, you know, if you go back hundreds and hundreds of years where you had people, they go, I'm getting on a boat and uh, go into the to the unknown frontier and we're just going to see what happens. And that's what you intend to do. And you just go. Um, but what doesn't make sense to me is if you have a situation where someone is state, they, they, they're, they're stating certain intentions, even if it's just to themselves and they have certain ambitions and their actions are completely not in alignment. Uh, you got to change one or the other. And if you can't, let's just put it this way. If you can't do the type of things that the person you want to be, whether that's a successful business person or a successful father or whatever, uh, if you can't do the things, then it's not going to happen. And it doesn't mean that you should just give up, but it means you should stop 
and reconsider. And I've done that many times uh, in my life and many in small and larger ways. Uh, and, and it's been, it's just been, again, one of those things that's kind of seared into my mind. And I've learned that lesson with myself several times. Um, but to your, to your question. So if the first step is curiosity, and if you have, you're curious about something, who knows, maybe that could be the thing that you dedicate the rest of your life to totally possible that it could be. Um, writing is really that for me, that's the most interesting thing, books and publishing and writing that arena is the most interesting commercial endeavor that I've come across and something that I can say right now, I would be perfectly happy working in for the rest of my life. I have other, my ambitions are not just to do it in the health and fitness space. I have other ambitions, but I really do enjoy studying. I really do enjoy creating content and I could find something else though. If for some reason, if, um, the gods decreed that I could no longer read and write anything, then I'd have to find, okay, what's something else that I am curious about that there's just, I'm just naturally drawn toward a little bit. And, and then I would go dive into that and I would, and I would again, do what we've been talking about. I would start reading books on it and start listening to podcasts and, and see how I, how I felt. Do I, is this drawing me in deeper or is it pushing me away? If it's pushing me away, I would find something else. And there's, I, I really do believe again, that everybody can find something that they have enough interest in that it can sustain them to get to that point to where they're good. And then it becomes a lot more fun because of course, in the beginning of anything, if you're not good, it's not fun. It's, it's, it's a pain in the ass. But if you know what good is, if you have good taste, right. And you have some standards and, and you are interested in the activity generally, and you feel drawn to get to good, that'll give you enough energy to, to get through the, that, that beginning period where it just feels um, it feels like you're not making any progress. So, so for me, again, I found writing and I only found it because I liked reading. I was actually doing this when I was like 18, 19, I was thinking to myself, I was like, okay, I'm gonna have to figure out making money. I don't want to just have a business. I'm not naturally, I'm not curious about entrepreneurship. Honestly, I'm not of just owning a business and selling things. That's what my dad did. Uh, and he did it well. And, um, that would have been the easy route would have been to just kind of go into his businesses and, and, um, maybe be groomed as his protege or something, but I wasn't interested in that. And so what was I interested in? I liked to read and I was a good student in school. Okay. Maybe I, I can't make money reading. I was trying to think about it. Like, nah, there's no real way to make money reading. Um, you have to create something in the world. You have to give something to the world to get something. And so writing was the obvious then, well, maybe I could enjoy writing. I don't know. I like to read. And so initially I was interested in writing fiction even though I, I read a fair amount of nonfiction, I just was more drawn toward writing fiction. So I started reading books on, on writing fiction and storytelling and found it very interesting. It was drawing me in and I wanted to read more and more uh, about it. And um, so that was a good sign. And I wrote a novel, which um, I'm sure is terrible. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't gone back and read it, um, but I got through it. It was maybe a hundred thousand words and I got through it fairly quickly, which was a good sign to me. And I enjoyed it. Not every minute of it, of course, but I overall, overall, I enjoyed the process and I enjoyed the satisfaction that came with finishing it. And, um, and so that was the beginning of my, of now what has become a career for me. And I, I 100% believe that m most everyone can, can do that. I, I don't think that there's, it's, I don't think I am, I'm, extraordinary in any way that, uh, you know, that, that accounts for, for that process and, um, cult, cult, cultivating curiosity though, is something that you, many people are going to have to do consciously again, because that's one of the things that I think our environment, I don't think it's, I really don't think it's a coincidence that, that our environment is engineered to be the way that it is. Um, I, I don't think in general that things just happen randomly or coincidentally. And I think that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm reading a book right now called thinking in systems about systems thinking. And in the book, I forget the name of the author, a woman, um, she's dead now, but she was a, she was a professor, I believe. And she makes a point that you, you can tell the purpose of a system by the behavior of how it behaves. Right. And, and by what it results in, regardless of what people might say the purpose of the system is, regardless of the rhetoric. And you see this all over everywhere. I think that 
the, again, this is another discussion, but I think that so many elements of our world, economic elements, social elements, cultural elements, educational elements, uh, are broken by design, not by incompetence or oopsies, or we didn't think of that. No, by design. And we think they're broken, but the people who design the systems do not think they're broken. <laughs> they, these systems are perfectly functional from their worldview. Uh, it's just what they, the rhetoric is completely opposite of what these systems were actually designed to produce. A perfect example of that is the history of central banking. If you study the history, history of central banking, uh, I recently read a book called The Creature from Jekyll Island. Um, I've read a fair amount of other stuff on that and watched there's a document, documentary, a good, another good one, place to start. Anybody interested is uh, The Money Masters. It's long, but a lot of good information. It was designed to create boom and bust cycles. It was designed to create um, it, massive inflation. It was designed to rob the middle class and enrich the upper class. These things didn't happen uh, just by themselves or they didn't happen organically. People smart people sat and they came up with plans and they thought about it. This is the goal. This is what we want. We want to have a, a banking cartel where we dominate the entire system. We want this cartel to extract wealth from the lower rungs of society and uh, siphon it to us. How do we do that? And how do we do it in a way that we can get Congress on board and how do we sell it to the people? And there's, again, there's uh, for anyone thinking, oh, the, oh, it's conspiracy theory. That's all history is, is a string of conspiracies. You don't have to study much of history to realize that that's what powerful people have been doing since the beginning of time. They get together and they go, how do we get more powerful? Well, first they go, how do, how do I individually become more powerful? And they quickly realize, like John Rockefeller Sr., his, uh, his story is a good example of this. They quickly realize that um, it's, it's smarter to form a cartel with their quote unquote competition than to compete with them. That's smarter even for the, to enrich themselves. It's a lot smarter for them to make their, their enemies, their allies, and then ally against everyone else, uh, than it is to fight everyone, including people who have the wealth and have the resolve and have the resources just in general to maybe destroy them. And, um, that's, there it is. Like that's all. That's that's throughout history. That's that's what happens. That's human nature. And to, to think that it's not happening today at every level of society, or well, I'd say in every um, in every sector of society, is is completely naive. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm kind of just ranting at this point. So <laughs> if if people though just unplug unplug from uh, entertainment period, stop watching Netflix. Just stop watching TV. Stop wasting time in social media, stop consuming mindless content of any kind, stop watching porn for fuck's sake. That's a whole nother topic. And, and focus on just f cultivating curiosity and learning to get, just get in touch with yourself. What type of things are you drawn toward? Uh, and then, and then just start pursuing those curiosities. I mean, that alone could, can work wonders. And I, I know firsthand myself and I know, um, firsthand having, had this discussion with many people over the years and having seen how it can change people. Awesome, Mike. Uh, honestly, I would love to keep going because um, I think we hit a good flow here and there are a lot of cool other topics that I would love to get into with you, but I want to be respectful of your time. So let's just stop here. And I want to thank you for taking the time. You've been giving a lot of actionable and concrete advice, which is awesome. So please just let people know where they can find out more about you, when, where they can find your work, and any resources that you would like them to check out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, hopefully, hopefully everybody finds it. <laughs> Sometimes I, you know, I look back on like if if I if I'm coming off like uh, in an arrogant, sanctimonious asshole. That's that's. I, I hope I hope that's not the case. I, I, sometimes if I get up on a soapbox and I get going, I, I understand how it might come across. Um, so hopefully it didn't come across that way. My, my intention is to be helpful and that's why I do everything that I do. And some areas maybe get, I'm a bit more, I'd say passionate about than others or some, some ideas I, f I believe very strongly in. And so um, I, I probably come across uh, maybe almost overly assertive about, but um, anyway, 
the best place to find me and all my stuff is is muscleforlife.com, musclefor.life.com. That's where you can find, you'll, you'll, there are links to everything there. And so I have articles, you know, health and fitness articles. I have kind of motivational stuff. Um, my, you'll, you can learn about my books, supplements, blah, blah, blah. Awesome. Uh, Mike, thank you for this. It was uh, an absolute pleasure talking to you. Yes, yes. Thanks for having me. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode with Mr. Matthews and you feel as inspired at the end of it as I am. He is one of those guys that is good to just kind of give you a kick in the ass, almost kind of in a Gary V sort of fashion. But anyway, just a little bit of call to action for the end. If you can leave a rating on iTunes and share the podcast to people that you think would benefit from hearing some of the messages that were shared here, that would be super awesome. This will help this podcast grow and reach more people over time. And it will also make it possible for me to get better and better guests over time. Like Mike Matthews. So if you want to listen to more interviews like this for months and years and years to come, then please make your contribution and help me reach more people with this. So please drop that rating, however many stars you think I deserve, and comment. Let me know what you thought of this. Your opinion is always welcomed. So with that, thank you for hanging around up until now. And with that, see you this upcoming Monday with some shorter episode. And then next Saturday with a long form episode again. Actually, the episode that's coming up is the carb debate between Mike Israel tell and mental hensel months so be sure to be subscribed to not miss that and i think i ran out of calls to action for now so have a great weekend everyone see you next time